Welcome to Future of Film's Virtual Production Revolution, our special show on the future of filmmaking and the pioneers who are making virtual production a reality. I'd like to say a huge thank you to all of our supporters who have made this series possible. Epic Games and Unreal Engine, Brompton Technology and Garden Studios in London whose incredible virtual production stage I am now sat on. So that just leaves me to say thank you again for listening and watching, and I hope you enjoy this episode of Virtual Production Revolution. Really excited to talk to you today at Garden Studios, because I know Brompton had a pivotal role in helping establish the studios here. Can you tell us a little bit about how you where where Brompton technology fits into the sort of virtual production space and particularly um, here at, on, on, on this stage yeah of course so as a whole Brompton's main role in, in virtual production is fundamentally receiving the video signal from a source be it unreal or unity or, or a media server like disguise and delivering that footage onto the LED screen. Um, sounds like a simple path, but it's actually quite complex. There's several issues you have to consider, brightness, color, you know, what your, what your image actually looks like when it's delivered final pixel onto the camera. And that's where Brompton really comes in into the problems we start solving. So when it comes to actually putting a camera in front of an LED wall, there are so many things that come into play. There's, there's timing both between the cameras and the LED and the source, all of that has to be in sync. That's one of the things that Brompton really gets into and sorts out. You also need precise and accurate control over your LED screen and what colors you're actually reproducing, otherwise you won't get a realistic, lifelike display on your screen. And that's another thing that, that Brompton brings in, whether that be through using 3D LUTs um, that you can bring into Brompton or, or control externally through things like LiveGrade from Pomfort, um, or using things like dynamic calibration, where you can set the primary color targets of your LED in real time on the fly for your production's needs. All of those things we start to bring to the table to solve real world problems when using LED mm. on camera. When it comes to Garden Studios, um, they approached us a couple of years ago um, with this project to build a studio in West London. Um, there's a huge shortage of studio space in, in the UK and in West London. And they wanted to build this space and deploy LED screens within the studio. Um, a lot of the larger studios right now are deploying large multi-thousand tile displays into their spaces, whereas Garden Studios wanted to approach of the they wanted to approach it with the idea of doing R and D testing and commercial shoots all within one space. So in this space here, you've got access for students to come in and learn how to shoot LED. You've got the ability for pre-production. So large streaming houses will come here before deploying onto a larger stage to test their workflows, to test their tracking, to test their content. And these kind of facilities really aren't very available. Mm -hmm. um, there's not many of them in the UK. So to have a space like this in West London for productions to come to to test their workflows is, is vital mm -hmm. to, to the growth of virtual production here in the UK. Mm -hmm. In terms of how we've supported Garden Studios, um, from day one, we were looking through their concepts, understanding the kind of screen they wanted to design, you know, what the curvature was going to be, what panels they were going to be using. Um, we attended camera tests with them to guide them through some of the issues that you see with, with LED on camera to say, hey, this is what causes this issue, this is what you want to avoid when you're shooting. Um, there's a whole raft of things um, that as an industry, we've all been learning over the past 18 months. Um, and that's really been, been key, is that involvement and cooperation both between Garden Studios and Brompton to making sure this stage was as good as it possibly could be 
and met the criteria of, of Garden Studios and, and what they wanted to use it for. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I mean, it's a lot, it's a lot to, um, I guess, unpack, but I think what what's really, I think, interesting for people to, to, to grasp about the, the you know the, the, the stages is it's it's not just a case of pointing a camera at it and you've got the you've got the, the background it's it's, a, it's incredibly complex at the end of the day you're trying to create an illusion right we're, we're trying to create an illusion we're on on, on this space station um, tell yeah t t tell me a little bit more about that about I guess I guess how how you go about creating that illusion so it really starts with um, a couple of factors the first is your your content and your your kind of content delivery mechanisms so most um will be using unreal or unity or pre-shot plates um play through back through a media server so these are envir the unreal and unity are, are, are digital environments and manipulated and, and and can be um yeah can be designed whatever you ever you like effectively Co correct yeah, yeah. You, you can now deliver essentially photorealistic environments via a, a games engine um, straight to the LED and then that can be manipulated in real time by creatives if your mountains are too big or too small you can change them if you don't like how cloudy the sky is you can change it um, these these games engines really do have mm. the flexibility that, that productions require um, but then you come round to um, pre-shot plates, and that really has come to fruition during 2020 and 2021, where travel onto various locations has been impossible. If we wanted to shoot in Venice tomorrow, we have to consider how are our crew getting there? Um, how much restrictions do we have? How can we shoot? And now with virtual production, I can say, cool, well, I'm just going to send uh, a local camera unit. We're going to go and shoot whatever scenes we want to in, in Venice, and then we're going to play them back here on this stage. Mm. All of my crew and my, my talent are all here. All of my suppliers are all here. I don't have to leave the safe COVID you know, environment of, of the studio. Uh, and I can put up any part of the world on the LED. And, and that really has been pivotal to the growth of, of virtual production. It is that flexibility that it offers, mm. both when you're using, you know, Unreal environments or Unity environments, so, you know, the creativity side of things, but also the practicality that that brings when we're coming to, to filmmaking during a global pandemic, which yeah. has been challenging for, for everyone. And uh, have, you, have you seen things accelerate a lot in the last, in 2020? Yeah, the, the past 18 months in terms of technology acceleration has been, has been huge, mm. whether that be from, from the tracking side of things, where, where all the tracking companies are really upping their game, everything is becoming much more reliable and, and easier to deploy, um, to obviously the, the LED panel manufacturers, they're all there upping their games, bringing out better and better LED um, panels every time that are now becoming aimed specifically at this market. Um, before we had obviously high quality panels that were being used here, but now the manufacturers have gone, okay, these are the features that, that filmmakers really care about. This is what this is what improves a panel to be used in, in the film world. And so we're starting to see panels hit the market that are designed specifically for virtual production. And whether that be with a, a wider color gamut or a faster refresh rate um, or, or a lower scan mass ratio, we're seeing panels hit the market now that are designed just to be used for virtual production. And then the same comes for you know, people like the camera manufacturers. They're starting to understand what they need to be doing for, for virtual production. So the technology really has been pushed forward by the pandemic. Um, it was just starting you know, in its infancy when, when the pandemic hit and everyone kind of got together and said, okay, well, we've got to make this technology work so that we can keep shooting films. Mm. Uh, and that really has driven the, the push towards this technology over the past 18 months. And it's going to continue to grow over the next several years, you know, the technology isn't finished yet. We still mm. have so many things that we can do with this technology that we're not doing yet. And the sky, the sky really is the limit with this stuff. Wow, wow. Yeah, pe with virtual production, often people will think of the, the Mandalorian, say, the, the vast volumes and the spectacular science fiction kind of stories. But are you seeing other examples, other types of projects using the tools now? Totally, yeah. I mean, 
those large volumes that we're seeing some of the major streaming houses deploy are, are vast and incredibly impressive and very, very useful to the, what they need to shoot. But when we come to talking about vehicle wraps, you know, if I'm wrapping a small to medium sized vehicle and I need that vehicle to be in California or I need it to be in Scotland or I need it to be here in London, I only need a small amount of LED to wrap that vehicle. Um, I don't need a, a four and a half thousand tile volume. I can be getting away with 30 or 40 tiles, you know, enough tiles to fit in the back of a, a small van. Uh, and that ability to deploy this technology onto smaller scale productions, you don't have to do your whole shoot on, on an LED stage. You can say, well, this particular shot, I want to do my car scene in, in Piccadilly Circus in central London. It's going to be hard and it's going to be expensive to get that shot done in Piccadilly Circus. So my other two options are build a practical set, which is also going to be very expensive and time consuming, or I can use LED. Um, you know, green screen with car wraps is incredibly challenging, um, requires a lot of post work and you have reflections to, to consider. With LED, because it's an emissive source, the content I play is reflected straight onto the vehicle. So if I have um, you know, the sky reflecting onto the windshield, that's real, that's there from my LED screen. And obviously there's a minimal amount of post required when I go and do that. And obviously I can now, if I'm doing a car commercial, for example, I can shoot for a particular car company in London, in Tokyo, in Paris, in LA, all in the same studio, all in the same safe environment, and I don't need to travel anywhere. Anywhere, I don't need to fly 40 crew members to each city. You know, So my carbon footprint is reduced by using this tech, but also it's faster and more convenient. I am you know, now can shoot everything in a matter of days rather than spending months moving to site, resetting up in another location, and trying to reshoot um, trying to shoot my, my scene there. I can just do it all here in, in the safety of a, of a controlled studio with my LED. Uh, and it means that you know when I'm, when I'm shooting at sunset, I haven't got to worry about timings. I can say, well, if something goes wrong, we can just play again. We can just cut and we can come back to the start um, because I'll just, I've got it all in the can ready to go. It's all ready to be played back onto my screen. So mm. in terms of smaller productions, it really has opened up the ability for them to go to exotic locations without needing the budget to go to exotic locations. Um, so while you still have these, these massive stages that are truly phenomenal, um, the smaller deployments of LED are equally as useful um, if they're used in the right way. Mm. Yeah, so I think often people think it's, a, it's all or nothing with virtual production. So it's either, it's, it's either a VP shoot or it's a traditional shoot. Are you seeing people starting to mix and match more? Yeah, absolutely. Um, it's it's not an all or nothing uh, approach. Obviously, there are some productions where using a LED stage for ninety percent of their shots might be the most efficient way. But there'll also be productions where actually they only need to shoot three scenes within an LED volume. It's not an all or nothing approach. And then the same comes with with virtual production. It's not an all or nothing approach with using just LED. You know, green screen and blue screen. It's still going to be around. It's still going to be required for certain shots. There's also the ability to mix blue screen and green screen with LED within the same shot. So we're not we're not going to have production saying, that's it, I'm never going to be on location, I'm never going to do things um, practically in real life ever again, I'm going to be on this stage doing stuff in, in, on LED forever. That's, that's totally not the case. Mm -hmm. But for certain shots, vehicle wraps um, are, are a prime example. We, we did one very recently with a, a train carriage um, that it just wasn't possible to, to shoot a train carriage in the location they wanted to. So we, they strapped a bunch of cameras to a, to a front of a commuter train, shot through the countryside, and then in the studio, wrapped a mock-up train carriage in LED and filmed there for a week. Mm. And there was no other way of, of doing this kind of shot um, effectively. You know, green screen would have, would have been a nightmare um, for, for post, um, and being there on location wouldn't have worked. But if we were doing something in a you know, country manner, like a period piece. Um, we have plenty of on-set locations we can travel to, and there's a kind of charm to doing it there in real life. So I don't think every production is gonna turn around and say, hey, everything needs to be virtual production now. I think they're gonna be identifying the places where virtual production is going to make their life easier or mm. more effective, 
or, or cheaper, uh, and then that's where they'll they'll go for it. Mm -hmm. Let's let's talk a little bit about live events because that I know that's where Brompton originally developed the, the technology. Um, that sector's obviously been a, a, a quite disrupted over the last eighteen months. Uh, where, where do you see that going now, and and what are you where, where where do you see Brompton playing a part in that? Totally, yeah. I mean, from the from the live event side, um, we are seeing hybrid and completely digital concerts um, becoming a reality. Several artists in, in Los Angeles have been using um, some of our stages that are, that are based over there with Brompton in it um, to stream out to, to millions of their fans while they can't tour, while they can't do shows. But we're also seeing that shift in the corporate world. Um, before, some of the tech companies really were starting to move towards that digital environment. They were already starting to stream their, their events while having members of, of the public in the auditoriums. Um, but now they're finding they can increase the production value by going to a fully um, digital virtual production broadcast watched by millions of people or shareholders or whoever they're aiming it towards. Um, you can also tailor it towards regions now um, using features like frame remapping. We're able to show two completely different um, sets of content on the screen simultaneously for different cameras to pick up at exactly the same time. So if we wanted a background for the US and a background for the UK, one with dollar pricing, one with pound pricing, we can make that happen in real time. Right, so that's, that's crazy. So you could say one per people could be seeing the science fiction landscape behind us and another people could be seeing the, the forest or something like that. Exactly, so we can, we can time the LED at a certain refresh rate and then time the cameras at a certain refresh rate. So we have one set of cameras that are seeing the forest and another set of the cameras that are seeing our, our lovely space station. And that really is opening up the ability for the broadcast, you know, the XR part of the market, um, to utilize those features for each region they're trying to get their messaging out to. Wow, wow. Uh, what, what do you see, what are the typical uh, or typical most common uh, challenges you face y using virtual production um, when, when, you, when you're on set? So the challenges, the challenges change um, as people learn. The mistakes we were making 18 months ago as a community are mistakes we're not making anymore. Um, so a lot of the content creation side has been, has been nailed down. Um, we're now onto the part of you know, experimental shots with LED. How close can we get without more? How quickly can we can we move the camera without the tracking becoming out of sync? How fast can we tilt the camera up and down without picking up visual artifacts? All of these problems are now um, problems that we're starting to be aware of, but we're also aware as a community on how to resolve or, or work around those problems. Um, as we did back in two years ago when we were talking about content assets being rendered out at 8K, but then displayed on uh, 200 pixel by 200 pixel space on an LED screen, which led to, led to other problems. So every problem that we, we face as a community in virtual production, we always find a solution to. People then go and do new things and find new problems to, to solve. Um, and as the technology moves forward so fast, we obviously have new cameras coming out all the time. We have new workflows coming out all the time, you know, different content engines, different playback systems. We also then have um, things like the, the graphics cards coming out from companies like AMD and NVIDIA. We always have new versions of those that, to integrate within our pipelines. So as a community, there's always new and interesting problems to solve. But I feel that you know, all of the vendors work together really well. When there is a problem on set, all of the vendors will get together and say, OK, this is the problem. How, how are we going to solve it? But it's the same with the, the filmmakers who, who are physically using this tech they are just as keen as everyone else when there is a problem to say, okay, cool, how do we, how do we solve this? How do we get around it? Mm. Yeah, you used the word community a few times there. Do you feel there is a, a, a special community around virtual production, a kind of collaboration mentality? It, it definitely feels that way. I mean, we have specialists um, approaching from, from different departments. We've got you know, camera, we have Unreal artists, we have LED technicians, all of these people coming together on set to collaborate together to get the, the end result has become really important. And it really has felt like a community where each department bringing their specialist knowledge to stitch all these components together, everyone understands that without one of the cogs, the whole, the whole workflow goes down. Um, and also, we, as, a, 
as a community, we're trying to be as inclusive as possible to attract new staff, new talent into this space. I mean, talent is something, as the industry has grown so quickly over the past two years, it's been challenging to find um, the right people to, to come and work on, on these stages or, or with the vendors or, or with the manufacturers, just because those skill sets are so new. So the whole community is, is really good at sharing knowledge, sharing advice, sharing tips, and saying, hey, I did this and this is where I went wrong. This is what you should do in the future. And I feel that you know over the past two years, that community has got a lot stronger and it has grown massively. And it will continue to do so over the coming years as we need more people in the industry to, to carry out this work. On, on that front, in terms of bringing in new talent and um, people entering the space, what would you be your recommendation to anyone who is, is watching this and is interested in, in getting involved in some capacity? Where, where should they start? So there's some, some really interesting routes into to this industry. Um, you obviously have the um, typical go to film school um, route. So obviously Garland Studios have a, a close tie with the, with the Met Film School. But then you have some non-standard routes to get into the industry. So when I say non-standard, I mean going to work for people like rental houses. So a lot of LED on productions, it will come from a rental house, just like you would with your camera or your grip equipment. And they're always looking for, for staff. So if you're in a, an 18 year old who wanted to get into the business and you weren't sure where to start, I, I would suggest looking at what rental companies are near you that work in this space, because that's a way of learning the equipment, um, be it from a camera side of things or a grip side of things or an LED side. Um, there's a whole vast array of companies that are involved in supporting this kind of production. And that's a really good way to get in and understand and learn the kit that's used and then understand how it's deployed in the field. Once you get those ground, you know, those, those grounds covered, you're then able to become effective as a, as a technician or an operator on site out in the wild. Mm. And, and that really is an interesting way of, of, of getting into the business that doesn't require um, you to get in through universities or, or get in through another mean. It's a really nice way of going, okay, I'm gonna work my way up from the ground, understand the kit, understand how it's used, and then get out there into the field and, and use the skills I've learned.